Thanks, Steve and Maria. Uh, good to follow you on this too, Maria. Because <laughs> if Maria was sitting up at this level, I'm going to take us down quite deep into a number of the streams that, that Maria talked about. And you'll e even see the parallels to Steve's assessment where we get into some of the conversations around tracking, um, responsibility, first life versus second life. Uh, for, for those that I've met before and talked with before, hello, nice to see you again. The last three years on Zoom and Microsoft Teams has been amazing to get out in person and see you face to face. I love it. For those that are meeting the first time, hello, welcome. Please stop by afterwards. I'd love just to chat and, and learn more about your business and make some of the more connections. The, um, I'll give you a bit of context on Calder Cycle. I'm going to then talk about um, the, the purpose behind this primer and how it came together. And then we're going to go through it in 10 infographics. It's all pictorial, and I'll articulate it. And then I'll pull that all together uh, for everybody at the end. Um, Call the Recycle was founded in 94 by six battery manufacturers who had a need to recycle their nickel cadmium batteries in North America. The Atlanta office was first. The Toronto office came in 97. You fast forward almost 30 years now, and we handle every chemistry that is in the marketplace. We work with uh, eight different industries. The most recent ones are the electric bicycle and the electric vehicle uh, industry. Uh, last year was the record year for us with 17 million pounds of batteries collected. Every year it goes up and up and up just because more and more devices uh, and propulsion systems are out there using the batteries. Uh, we have 25,000 collection points that we pick up batteries from and we bring them to about a dozen destinations in, in North America. Our software platform is Microsoft cloud-based and we track, okay? So everything up to and not including EVs is tracked in batches because that's all you need to do. You don't need to track every individual cell. When you get to EVs starting this Q2, we're tracking EVs by <laughs> serial number, part number, VIN number, or battery identification number. And that gets to the need for tracking and knowing where the batteries are and where they're going. You know, where'd you get it from? Who are you handing it off to? My involvement with batteries started in 2012. I was with Energizer at the time when I found out about Call the Recycle. I joined the Canadian board and spent seven years working with the Canadian operation of Call the Recycle. There's a U.S. operation. They're sister companies and they share the same back end, um, same software, same finance stuff. Um, and, in, uh, and then it was in 2019 where I came off the board to head up the build out of infrastructure for both the US and Canadian called recycles to address everything for electric transportation. And, and when I say like, you know, hey, a guy came off the board to do this, like, it takes a different logistics network to actually handle these batteries. E-bike batteries come back from bicycle shops. It's very different than coming back from a municipal waste depot. Electric vehicle batteries are going to be picked up at dismantlers, at shredders, at dealerships, uh, at fleet centers. And they have to go to actually a variety of places. It might go to an R&D center. It might go to a recycler. It might go to a repurposer, a remanufacturer. We've heard these names already thrown about. Um, and so we're, we have the ability to tr uh, track that and deliver that to any of those, uh, those locations. And so, we, so I, I, we have to build this out for the organization. But here we are. The, um, I'm going to shift here now to this, to this primer. Um, us and the Canadian Vehicle Manufacturers Association felt the need to articulate for everybody in the industry the ecosystem for the life of a battery as it comes out of a vehicle until it gets to recycling. We felt that need because it, at a really, really macro level, we all understood that we needed to recycle these batteries because we have to make new batteries from used batteries because there's not enough minerals to mine. We talked about that already today. But what we didn't know, and none of us saw the full picture is, okay, how does that battery go from in that car to that recycler and how many steps? So a, a two year research, writing, um, publishing infographics, publishing a document, and, and we have it all mapped. And we have it all mapped for everybody here. And it's in, it was in the link that Steve had sent out before and there'll be a follow up and you'll get the link to that to that document. Um, I, I, I'll tell you, again, uh, we talked to 154 people in the end. In the document, we wrote 100. It's actually 154 individuals. Many of you in the room were part of conversations. Two, two key things here. One, it is more developed than many of us thought. 
okay, way more developed. It's actually once you start to piece together the spokes to look at the full wheel, do you actually get a picture of standing back and going, wow, this thing is actually kind of humming on its own. And then we saw, hey, there, there are some myths that need to be dispelled, and I'll talk about a few of these myths as I go through it. And then there's things that we have to do to, you know, to, to pull the last piece together, and then there's things we shouldn't do. And that's where I'm going to end this conversation at the back end here about, hey, what should we do and what shouldn't we do? I talked about the, the purpose here of describing the ecosystem for moving a battery from a, from a vehicle. So I'm going to get right into this first infographic here. There are five pathways that batteries will travel as they come out of a vehicle. And the, the pathways we've called with ours, because we all know reduce, reuse, recycle, and it was very easy to stay with the R theme. The, the key here is that reduce, reuse, recycle is a hierarchy, and this is not a hierarchy. This is five different pathways, and the batteries will hop pathways depending on a number of different things. The health of the battery, the geographic location of the battery, which type of downstream activity is close to the battery, well, who has a contract on that battery? Because there is a under warranty, there, there's a, um, it's under the OEM's guidance. Outside of warranty, you might be outside of guidance, maybe a dismantler owns it, and there's a decision, a different decision that has to be made because of the ownership there. The batteries will move in different forms versus a, a, a linear hierarchy. So we have repair, remanufacturing, resale as is, repurpose, and recycling are the five different pathways. And what you'll notice by how we've laid this out is that everything moves to the right. Nothing actually moves to the left. So if, you, if I take, for example, uh, the, the battery the cars at the dealership and something's not right, they will diagnose it. And if it can be fixed at the dealership, that's the first pathway. If it can't, it comes out and it'll go to a remanufacturer somewhere in North America. But it, if it's not good enough remanufacturing, it's not going back to the left to be repaired again it will be remanufactured and put back into another light vehicle or it travels to the right again. And the same thing when you're reselling it. If, if a battery goes for resale, it doesn't move back to repair. It's already been through a repair analysis. It's already been through a remanufacturing analysis. After resale comes repurpose, so on. And at the bottom, the, the last channel I should say is direct to recycling, but everything ends up at recycling at the end. Everything will um, funnel down there. Um, any questions on that as far as like a, a visual on how the five pathways exist? Yeah, uh, Mark. Mark, Mark after we zoom yeah. oh, Steve said I have to mention my name. Uh, excellent visual. I, I, said, I think a picture sp speaks a thousand words. Do you have any idea as to what the volume of batteries would go via each branch? We, we didn't look at volume uh, by branch. And I, you know, asking the question right now is an excellent question. I probably would say still early. Like, there's not enough tracking as to seeing where it is and tying all that together. If we go, Mark, I bet you go 20 years out, we're going to have a lot of clarity. Okay. But, 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 uh, absolutely. Um, okay, so let's go to, to here. We have to now take a look at where the batteries are going to come out of the vehicle for them to start traveling down the, the pathways here. And we'll separate this between under warranty and, and out of warranty. And on the left side, under warranty, the majority of the batteries are being handled by the dealerships um, and coming out there. And a minority is being handled by the auto dismantler community. And those generally are crash vehicles or early retirements for whatever reason. And, and we see them in the inventories. They're there. But it's a small portion of it. And there'll be a little bit at some fleet centers. You know, fleet center, Mo uh, Montreal Transit Commission has a large fleet of buses, and they will generate some batteries periodically for recycling. That's an example of a fleet center. Independent garages, Canada doesn't have many. Most are in California, but, but they do exist. Uh, garages will handle the batteries. Out of warranty is where you start to get a rebalancing. And we, we believe we're going to see that the auto dismantling community is going to have a slight majority of the vehicles. The dealerships will be next in size, and we could argue the proportion here. We're trying to take a bit of an estimate. Um, it, but a number of car owners will stay with the dealership because of the perceived complexity around the battery and the operating system, and maybe I should stay here with the dealerships. Others will say I'm going to an independent garage. And then as life goes on for the vehicle, 
and it goes to auction and we purchase it and now it comes to one of our yards and that's where you get to see a large majority at, at the dismantlers. The, the main takeaway here though is you, you got two groups, really. I mean, yes, there's gonna be some fleet, yes, some independent, but it's really two groups. And so if I'm a policy maker and I look at this, we don't have 200 different groups that I gotta worry about for policy. I have two groups, they're well established, they have good discipline, they know each other, there's some harmony here, all right? I, what I would say is there's no panic, right? These industries know what to do, you gotta let them mature with these, with these new products and things will start to take shape. And this is what we're seeing as we started to analyze the ecosystem. So I'm gonna take that first slide of the five <coughs> pathways and now I'm gonna draw it out to how the industry looks and starts to come together. And it, it ties together the two slides. So the first slide talks about uh, repair, remanufacturing, resale, repurpose, and recycling. You will see them on here. You'll find repairs there, recycling's there, repurposing, resale, they're all in here. We also talked about on the second slide that under warranty, out of warranty. So if you look on the left side, that generally speaking is warranty side. The right side is generally speaking out of warranty where the activity happens and you'll see the interconnectivity of the two. And then you have the lines between them. Solid lines are well developed. It, 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 it's not hard to actually get a carrier and to move a battery between point A and point B. Dotted lines might be a little harder to, to get a carrier. Some you might struggle, remote locations. I got a battery far north or I got a battery, a battery in a car buried under four feet of snow. You might need more help. But what we are finding is you can get it done. You gotta know the right companies to work with, the right people who have experience, but you can get it done. Um, and so what I've called Recycle is the lines, by the way. Our company is the logistics movement of all these batteries. And there are many other players in this room who play different roles. There's diagnostic companies, there's repurposers, uh, there's remanufacturers. We all play in this ecosystem and we're at a spot now where everything is so young that the collaboration, we found when we did this assessment, the collaboration is amazing. Everybody is rolling up their sleeves and trying to help each other build this thing out. Any, any questions? So where are the destinations in North America? I, I love this map because it, it, it's colorful, it's clear, you start to see hey, where can I send these? Who are the companies? The, the part that um, I love saying is that go back five years ago, there were only five dots on this chart. There were five recyclers. And, and we had one in Canada and we had four in the United States. And of the five locations, there were actually only four companies, one owned two sites. And today, we have 12 different recycling facilities alone that are open and there are five more announced and not yet built and operational. Okay, so you get to see that. You get to see the remanufacturers in um, orange here who are active in this space. You get to see the repurposers and where they're starting to show up uh, on, this, uh, on this chart. Um, one of the myths that we had heard as we did the research here is that there's not enough capacity for, for these batteries. That there's, just, there's not enough. Like, wh where are you going to take them off? We've got to do something about it. We've never had a battery refused at any one of the recyclers. I know all the recyclers, we talk to them. We're very collaborative. Everybody has room to take batteries. There is way more capacity than there is batteries available to feed 12 sites today and 17, there'll be 17 within three years, okay? Don't worry about capacity, there's more than enough. So I, I'll get into uh, logistics here. There's a, a couple of things I'll say first before I point to the diagram of how the, the batteries move and the containers move. I, I, the starting place here is logistics of moving a battery is between 60 and 90% of the cost of handling the battery. So you really, really gotta pay attention to your freight. Freight analysis, I, I would spend months doing freight analysis and then I would redo it again and again because you could eat up so much of your profit if you're choosing uh, other uh, factors that you will choose as to who you're gonna work with without considering the freight. It might be more expensive to go further distance than it is to find something close by. Um, I will bring into this conversation that the conversation around 
technology, I'm not going to go deep on this, but it, you know, there's pyrometallurgical, hydrometallurgical technologies for recycling. And you will want hydrometallurgical te technology to make new batteries out of used batteries. But it does not mean pyrometallurgical uh, recycling is bad. I want all of us to consider this, that if you have to ship a battery long distance and create a carbon footprint for that movement versus getting to a recycler that is closer, that might not be the best thing for the environment. It might not be the best thing financially. But on the flip side, maybe it is. Maybe you have a relationship that is strategic, that is very important, that you want to work with a certain downstream repurposer who is a little bit further from you, that makes a ton of sense. I bring this up just, you've got to consider a number of different factors when you're looking at this, knowing that freight is a big piece and freight is, is huge for carbon footprint. Um, as far as what does it cost to ship a battery, I, You'll be as little as you know, 100 bucks, 150 bucks for a close distance. You could be as, as high as $800 if you're going to move this thing three quarters of the way across the country. It's a, it, that's real dollars uh, that, that you've got to be concerned about. If it's a damaged, defective battery, you have to have a container. And if you don't have a container, you're going to order one in. So you've got an inbound freight. You might even have a rental charge for a container. And then you've got to ship it, ship it back. Um, if you have an end-of-life battery and you're working with a company who has a permit to ship it on pallets, like Polar Recycle, you don't have to order a container. We're just going to move it on a pallet for you, so you can save some money there. A lot of different factors. A container, if you wanted to buy containers. So if you're a very large dismantler, and we're all going to be generating a lot of these batteries, if you're a large dismantler, you might choose to invest in a few containers for damaged effectives in your own inventory. And a damaged defective container, packing group one, could be $1,500 for a wood one, all the way up to $65,000 US dollars for steel. Okay, and I won't get into the difference. There is absolutely difference, and there's reasons to buy either one. And happy to chat about that, but I'm just trying to give you, give you an idea. Um, so that all those items are in the primer. They're in chapter nine. There's a lot of financial numbers there that we give perspective on. To talk about the movement of the batteries, there's really two streams. If you're a dealership top, if you're not a dismantler, it's going to be bottom. At the dealership, generally speaking, there's a new battery coming into the dealership to go into the vehicle as the, that battery comes out. So, so someone with me, my car goes into the dealership, it's not working so well, they analyze it, hey, I can't repair this, i got to send it for remanufacturing. They will order in a battery, it'll arrive. The battery in my car comes out and it goes to remanufacture, I get that other battery. That might have been rebuilt two months ago. It might be a brand new one. I drive away in 48 hours with not my original battery, but really, why do I care? The battery they took out goes into the same container that the new one arrived in. Okay, so containers into the dealership, battery comes out, battery swap, the used battery goes in that container, and it moves on the truck, it gets to the destination, and you have an empty container that can go back into a fleet of containers for reuse. If you're a dismantler, you don't have a container arriving. That's the main point here. And you have to get a container. So you might, like I mentioned, if you're big and you might invest in a couple, or you're gonna work with a logistics company who has access to containers, particularly for damaged defectives. End of life, so if you're working with some companies, they will have a permit to ship it on pallet, but others won't. And that'll be part of what we're gonna sort out here. But then you see container arrives, battery goes in it, it moves, and then that container gets reused. We don't know how long, how many years, how many uses containers will last. Such a new industry that we haven't seen that yet. So that's still to come. And so this was like a, a whole thing on financials and logistics and the cost of moving. A anything else that you'd like to know about a cost structure here for moving batteries around? Uh, Jeff, I have a question here. Yes, please. How do you classify So, so the question is, how do you identify a defective or damaged battery versus an end-of-life battery? Um, we, we talk about it as, as going actually from the worst to the easiest. We start with thermal event, because that's the easiest to identify. A thermal event, and that is the word the industry uses. Okay. It's very easy to use the word fire. Hey, that's a burnt battery, it's a fire battery. But actually, a thermal event is just as bad. You just don't have a flame yet, so that's why we use the word thermal. 
What that means is one of the cells inside is heating up, and the hotter it gets, the worse the situation gets, and it's the heat of the first cell heats up the second cell, and then the second cell gets really hot and it heats up the third, and you get to a, a point where you'll end up at a, a flash point, and that's when you start to see the flame. But before you get to flame, you have heat coming off the battery, you will have uh, a whitish, grayish smoke coming off the battery. You will have a sweet bubblegum smell that you will ide identify. Um, you will have burn marks showing up on the battery. You will have swelling of the battery pack. You will have melting plastic from the battery pack. Anything like that, you have an emergency situation. You're going to call 911. You better have an emergency preparedness plan. I'm not here to actually talk about emergency plans, but if anyone wants to chat about that afterwards, I'll talk with you about that. You all need an emergency plan. You follow your plan. You have a situation on hand immediately. Okay? Now, thermal event aside, once it's done and the battery has now rested, and there's a debate as to, it's not a debate. There, we're all learning how long a battery has to sit before it moves from thermal to just damaged. Some people will say seven days, others say 14, I've heard as long as 30. The point is, is that we've seen it, a battery can sit as long as two months and still go into thermal runaway after an, an incident, okay? Once you are comfortable and you're beyond, I got a situation live, that battery moves to damaged, okay? And, and you're gonna handle, handle the damage. Now, what is a damaged battery that hasn't been in a thermal event? Battery that, that was dropped? A battery that has a cracked outer shell, a battery that is missing screws that hold the top and the bottom together, right? If the screws are missing, you don't know who tried to be in there. And anyone that goes in there, you should not trust that at that point, okay? I call that tampering, right? So anything that looks like someone got in there, if you have wires hanging out of the battery, I, I'd be concerned about that, right? Those are all examples. Oh, um, corrosion on the terminals and water. Here's another one, if at your yard and you show up in the morning and there's a pool of water around a battery pack sitting there, I'd be like, okay, why? That, that should not happen. And that to me is part of damage. And then if it isn't everything that I just said, you're end of life. And then end of life is gonna be like 95% of these things. Great question. Sorry, it takes a bit to answer that one. Okay. Jeff, is there any concern, you know, right now, whatever the number is, is there a concern on this when, as this scales up? You know, you were suggesting earlier, hey, you can get rid of it, don't worry about it. What happens when eight of ten of us have, you know, are we prepared for that, I guess? Sure. The, the logistics structure is there today to handle the volume ramp up. Absolutely. The, the safety infrastructure is not there today. I, I think, and that's one thing I was, we talk about in our recommendations here, is safety has to be something that we all take seriously, put the safety first. Policy makers should look at standards for safety. Safety materials need to become more prevalent. Uh, we all have to share what works and doesn't work. Uh, it, like literally sharing what works and doesn't work is probably one of the single best things we could all do today. Um, simply said, for safety, a thermal sensor, you want a, a thermal imaging gun basically in your yard. You want a four gas meter. When I say four gas, I mean four, it analyzes four different gases that give off by the battery. You want that in your yard. You probably want a fire blanket. A fire blanket is, doesn't solve the problem. It buys you time till the fire department gets there. And there's tricks to using the fire the blanket that the fire department understands. But you should have one because it buys you time and saves your building. Uh, heat sensitive gloves. Like that to me is your minimum repertoire of safety things that we got to get into the field. Good question. Jeff, did you say 95% of batteries will go to recycling? 95% are end of life, me meaning that they're, they're just there. So when a recycler gets it, 95 out of 100 are going to go through a recycling process via, you know, called recycle logistics, as you're talking about, to, you know, um, you, you'll actually, you'll be able to, re, whether it's recycling or repurposing, uh, it, they'll all be able to be handled. Uh, when I said 95%, it's, uh, those are the end of, ones that are defined as end of life. The other 5% are damaged effective. Damaged effectives have to go to recycling. They don't go to repurposing first. They have to go for recycling because they've been damaged. The end of life could go down a number of different streams. They all make it to a good home. 
Do you have any, any idea on how many would actually be built for reuse for its intended purpose? I, I don't know yet. And I think the, the industry has to evolve uh, there. Just, just touch your key. <laughs> Just one minute. Minute. No, it just it just needs to get an input. You're good. Okay. Yes. So in the recycling or recycling industry, after uh, EVs, we take a vehicle of gas combustion engine. You can go by miles, you can judge emission, you can do tests, all that sort of thing. So with the new, we've got a few electric vehicles, information from ARA at a process, and we, we're, we're getting ahead around that. That part is not so bad, we're learning. But how do we judge whether that car is at that 70% level? Yes. Ability to, to sell for reuse or whether it needs to be repurposed? But this, this is one way to be So we, is there any information for us as an industry? Yeah, I, I, the question is excellent. I have two slides on that. If you don't mind, yeah. I'll get to them in, in the, I don't know if they're next or two after that. And I'll absolutely talk to that. Yeah, great question. Okay, so um, let's move on. It's not this one, but it's coming up next. So, uh, so this is about first life, second life. We started to touch on this. It's very, this is very, very, very important. Um, you, could, you could carve up this industry different ways. We talked about you know, thermal event damage, defective, end of life. That's one way to look at it. You could look at it as repurposing, remanufacturing in different pathways. You also could carve this up by what's first life versus second life. And so if you take the same pathways, you'll see them here. First life is repair. That's done at the dealership level where the battery could be fixed up and you're on your way within the same day. The battery never came out of the car. Uh, remanufacturing, the battery did come out of the car. It was rebuilt. It goes back into the same model just two-ish months later. It shows back up in someone else's car for the same intent. That is still first life. And then resale as is, when you sell a battery for the use in the same vehicle model, you just put it, you can put this up on eBay. You can put it up on, um, or, or has, you have a site too. And if it's bought and goes back into the same model, it's still first life because it's, it's uh, the same intended use. Where second life comes in is when the intended use changes and there's a transaction that happened between two entities and the ownership of the battery changes. This is very, very important. It's no longer the vehicle manufacturer who put that product on the market. It is someone else. So in the first picture at the bottom, we, you know, we, we drew a, the first car is green, the second car is white, because it's a different car. Right? So if a battery comes out and it goes into a different model, it wasn't made for that model. Now it's your own risk. You might have done it yourself. You might have taken it to an independent garage. So what does this look like? Someone who takes a Tesla Model S battery and puts it into a 1981 classic Porsche because it's cool and it's fun and I want to drive around Florida like that. That's no longer First Life. That's a brand new product. Whoever did that for you, that's their responsibility and you're the new owner of that. Okay? The next is it goes for energy storage. Right? Take the same Tesla Model S battery and now it goes into a power bank that's running a building. That's a different use. Whoever built that power bank of batteries, that's a new product. They're responsible for that. In the last picture here with the drill bits and the wrench, someone's playing with that battery. Right? So you opened it up at your garage. Even let's use our, one of our dismantler sites. One of our ladies or gentlemen opened it up because, hey, it's cool. I want to see what this looks like. like. Not only did you buy it, now you're actually responsible for it because you looked inside. Right? That's now second life. You took responsibility by starting to get into it. We can't mess with these batteries. It's, it's a mix of energy, but it's also a mix of software. And as soon as we tamper with it and accidentally screw up the software that manages the batteries or accidentally puncture, and you, you won't even know sometimes you puncture a battery till you close it up and it's slowly tricking out, tr trickling out the, the battery uh, material, which starts to smell. You might not even know it for three, four days after you close it up but you've done something to it. Yes? Yes, Jeff, uh, can I just on the uh, retailers of DC? Uh, would you define repair or non-warranty battery repair by the independent as a first life or second life? If, it, if, the, if it's non-warranty, so 
non-warranty, still in the same vehicle that you bought, it, it's still a first life activity. Right. Uh, as long as they're doing the repairs based upon you know, trained professionals following the guidelines of the OEMs, they're not getting into the pack to play with the pack. So, so, under, so under an EPR, there would be no transfer of liability in this case? I, I, I actually won't even answer that, I apologize, because I'm not a lawyer. <laughs> I don't represent an OEM or the government. <laughs> but I know where you're coming from. Yeah, Mark? But, but Jeff, but to, to be able to determine whether the battery pack can be reused, don't you have to look into the pack? Don't you have to look at different modules? You, you can. But, but it, no, but, but I mean, that's the only way to do it. You, you, like like, like you, you said, you know, if, if you change it and reuse it in a vehicle, is it then still first life? If, uh, what, what I can say if that's clear is if it's being remanufactured under the guidance of the OEM at a remanufacturing facility and they've opened it up, that will stay first life if it goes back into the same vehicle that models that it was intended. If you have an independent who is not trained by the OEM and is not following any of those guidelines, I, I won't comment on that. We're into a gray zone here. I, the conversation is really good. This is why first life, second life is important and, and we have some policy leaders here in the room. This is one of the things that uh, with involvement from industry, please don't write policy on your own, include the industry and the industry can help, but clarity around this will be very good. Okay, so to the question the gentleman had about diagnostics. Um, the, I love diagnostics. It is, has the biggest potential to add value and it is the most the least developed of any of the areas of managing a battery at the end of vehicle life. Um, we know of uh, a number of companies that are in this space getting going, but it's really early days. I, I actually have a vision here. I, I can see where this is going. We're going to end up with a really high, robust algorithm app on our phones with a special cable that will be able to plug into a vehicle. and at proper locations, like a dismantling site, you're going to be able to get a read. We're not there yet. We're not. But I, I know, for example, Cox Automotive, which owns Mannheim, is piloting an algorithm-based prototype in California, and they're finding uh, really good data. And I got a screenshot of what one of the reports looks like. And they're finding that uh, vehicles that have a report are transacting at 2.5% higher dollar value already than ones without a report. Two and a half doesn't seem like a lot, but the millions of cars that get sold at auction, if you multiply that out, that could be an extra million dollars for an auto dismantler who knows and could get two and a half percent more when you sell the battery. And that, that's a good number. Okay? Four spots on a pack where you diagnose. Analytics looks at the whole pack. It exists today in many vehicles. Most vehicles actually have a variety of analytics. It's on the battery. It's an item that's like five inches by five inches square, one inch thick, and it's reading the entire battery pack health and it's transmitting that back to a central location, third party company that's aggregating that data. So it's not my car, it's not your car, it's not your car. It's all the cars in the fleet. And it will give um, broad based health assessments of the fleet of batteries. It measures temperatures, it measures um, geographic location, it will measure heights. So if you talk with a company like Geotab that specializes in this, their analytics will tell you that the average battery degrades at 2.3% per year. Their analytics will also tell you that at temperatures higher than 27 degrees Celsius, your battery will degrade faster than below 27. And they'll also tell you that at minus 20, your battery is not degrading. You just don't have enough storage capacity because of the cold. That's why you can't drive as far. But you didn't degrade in the minuses. When you come back to positive te temperatures, you still have full capacity. It's over 27. That type of data is what you get at the analytics level. Next down is the battery management system. Plug into the OBD port. Take a read of the battery health. That's what's happening at uh, some of the remanufacturers will do it that way. Um, that's what will happen at the dealerships and you, they get a readout and that'll tell them a story 
and from that, <coughs> they'll be able to make some decisions. Down to the module level, <coughs> excuse me, uh, there's a company that's designed a ultrasound system to test the module. <coughs> highly fast, highly accurate, but a little cumbersome because you need the algorithms, you need to create a unique algorithm per vehicle manufacturer that that battery was built and used for, and you've got to disassemble the battery pack. That use will come in at very large auto dismantlers where you have thousands of battery, uh, vehicles that you're processing. It might be beneficial to get an ultrasound system, disassemble your batteries to modules, and then start selling modules because this one holds higher energy than this one. This one I'll sell for more money to that repurposer. That one I will send to another repurposer. And then cell level is uh, generally the repurposers are working at the cell level they will break it down and literally test every cell and keep the good ones. Seventy percent generally are good, we're finding, we're hearing, and then thirty percent have to go for recycling. <clears throat> Those are the four levels. How that breaks down visually in a vehicle, this is diagnostics now at, at a visual, um, when you're doing the analytics, it is, it is transmitting through the cloud and the satellites back to a central location, is how that information is transmitting. The, Battery management system is a plug-in to the vehicle and you're taking a read with a tool. The ultrasound is that, that is the machine. Um, Titan is the company that uh, is pioneering that and they have some tests going on right now. And then the, the individual analysis, we use a stethoscope, but literally like you're putting the tool on both ends and you're reading the cell uh, like, like that. Okay. That, sir, who asked the question, um, it, this, this is forthcoming. It, very early days, but I, I really believe that the auto dismantlers within the next three-ish years will be able to start piloting these type, some of these tools that will start to create value, separate the good batteries from the less good, and then you'll be able to charge different prices. This is a picture of the Mannheim report that comes out of uh, the test that they're doing out of California. I love it for its simplicity, honestly. Like, Okay, that clearly that's a Nissan Leaf, and it tells you the model year, and you uh, see on here the, uh, the battery capacity, when new, 21.2, the range of the battery at new was 73, it gives it a score, 4.9, so uh, the high, like that number goes up to, uh, to 5, and the lower number will go down to 0. That number is an algorithm driven, so don't worry about like, well, why did I get a 4.9 versus a 4.8, it just means at 4.9 you, you get more mileage, a little bit healthier. And then these two uh, plugs here, like, it's just, just kind of cool. Um, it tells you that the range when new was 73 miles, and it tells you today that this vehicle will get between 65 and 73. Like, it's a damn good battery, this one. It's almost like new, and it's a 2012 Leaf, this, this one. And it tells you that there was 2,657 charges on your battery. Okay? Generally speaking, batteries degrade by temperature, uh, by altitude, by number of charge cycles that, uh, that are being put on it, and the type of load. That's the other thing, whether you're doing the different charging rates. Uh, what they are finding through these analysis is that a fast charge is degraded battery quicker than one of the slower charges. My gut feel is that'll change over time with technology, but that's what they've seen up till now. So that's an example of a report coming out of the Mannheim Group. Okay, last slide on the infographics and then I'll start to wrap this up here. The, if you took the industry and you put it on an upside down triangle, today because the industry is new, the, the electric vehicle, like we're, we're, we know the oldest hybrids, uh, 2020, we know that Tesla, roughly speaking, 2008, 9, 10, and then here we are today. It is a young industry, most of the battery, full battery electric vehicles are under warranty, which is why you see at least 50% of the vehicles out there today are being managed by the OEMs. The next tier is what we call EV batteries managed by market forces, buy and sell, profitability, good, bad, ugly kind of stuff. So I, a lot of batteries have value, and I think some of us know that. You could sell a Nissan Leaf and make some money. You could sell a Tesla battery. And, and you'll make some money. Pri some Priuses will make you some good money. As the repurposers are coming up, they're purchasing some batteries and you could get some there. But we also know that we have some sitting in our yards and we can't get rid of them and no one wants them. All right, those last batteries, the ones that I mentioned that, you know, why do they sit around? They have low economic value. 
there's not enough demand for those batteries and we're sitting on them. And that's the orange triangle on the bottom. In, in the summary to this graph here, when we talk about the industry, and are we wondering, oh my God, that the batteries, we don't know where they are, no one has them under control, oh my God, they go in a landfill, and that's another myth that these things walk into landfill, they don't, they're too big, they're too heavy. They are with us at the auto dismantler yards. They're at the auto shredder yards. That's where they are be, until the economic value changes. Okay? And that is one small piece in the, the uh, vehicle manufacturers, no one understand this, and they are looking at a solution for that. So to pull it together on recommendations, this is where I'll get to policy, um, government regs. There's some really interesting things uh, to understand about the regulations. First thing I was, I'll say is that <coughs> our law, the laws in Canada are really good. And they were all written before this industry became a thing. And so if you get frustrated, don't get frustrated at the people who manage the laws. The law was written before an EV battery was created. Sometimes we're putting a new product on the market that doesn't quite fit. All right? So I, I talk with the folks at NRCAN and Environment and Climate Change Canada and Transport Canada, and, and we talk with USDOT and EPA as well. Um, what we'll say here is this. We need one national policy to look at EV batteries across all the departments. And I'll, and I'll give an example as to why. Why do we need that? Because Transport Canada calls it a dangerous good. Environment Climate Change Canada calls it a hazardous recyclable material. And a province calls it a waste. Transport Canada classifies it as a UN standard class nine. Environment <coughs> Climate Change Canada follows, follows the Basel Accord and they call it a has eight. It's the exact <coughs> same product and it has three different names and two different classes. It's very confusing. We are a North American industry, the cars and the parts travel across the borders to get built, the batteries move around. We need one policy that standardizes everything so that we could keep the cost structure low, keep the carbon footprint low, and keep the batteries moving. If we don't, so you say to yourself, well, why don't we just stay with the way we are? We will force batteries to be stranded because it's a bit cumbersome, and we're gonna force a higher, higher cost structure, and you're gonna see your car prices go up even more by province if you don't, and you're gonna have a higher carbon footprint. Um, all policies impacting EV batteries should look at their entire useful life. Don't force an early retirement of a battery when you talk about policy. The batteries we, we are seeing from Circular Energy who tracks this, the youngest is 10 years on average, the oldest is 21 years on average, and the middle is 15 to 18 years that the batteries are lasting. And that's vehicle. Now we could have a second life in some instances. <coughs> let the batteries have their full life, let them jump the pathways that exist, uh, and, and move around, that is the best way that we could manage this industry and let it be a, um, a low carbon footprint, profitable industry and a safe industry. We got to review a couple of uh, regulations at Transport Canada and Environment and Climate Change Canada. Again, it's not the individuals. I love talking with the folks. The laws were written before the batteries. So here, I'll give you a couple of examples. At Environment and Climate Change Canada regulates the cross-border movement of batteries. So if you have a battery to move from Canada to the US, a battery going for R&D assessment for remanufacturing and repurposing does not need a permit to cross the border. But a battery going for recycling has to have a permit to cross the border. <coughs> I ask the question why, it's the same battery, just a different destination. There's no good answer for that. I, I understand why we're here because Environment Climate Change Canada follows the Basel Accord and that's the way the Basel Accord was written. But we got to do something about that because that disadvantages those in the recycling business versus those in the repurposing business and that forces the auto dismantlers to make different choices that might not be the best choice for that battery. Transport Canada has a different thing that they got to look at. Uh, the, the, here's, here's where to, to start this one is that the USDOT looks at end of life with the ability to ship on pallets or in a certain containment device. Damaged effective with the USDOT has to be in a container and they talk about the types of containers. But they classify all batteries the same. They look at all batteries as, as the same. It's a lithium ion battery. Transport Canada regs say that uh, they divide it by small and large and it's all volumetric. So if you're less than 450 liters, you are called a small battery and you have certain rules. And if you're greater than 450 liters, you're called a large battery and you have other rules. 
hybrids fit small and the battery electrics fit large. Now here's where it gets interesting, is on the small, it says you have to use a container. Even if it's end of life, you have to use a container. Well, I talked about that earlier, now you go to order one, and you're gonna have a shipping cost of 200 bucks to get that container. So cost structures go up. When you get to the large size, there are no standards for large size that in Transport Canada references, so you actually have to apply for an equivalency certificate for permission to do something custom, and you have to propose your custom solution, and they say yay or nay. And then you have a different solution for that. So if I'm a vehicle manufacturer and I have a battery electric and I also sell hybrids <coughs> and I'm in Canada and I'm in the US, now my Canada cost structure to operate is much more higher because I have to worry about my small with containers and my big without and I got two different classes and I got paperwork to do for the equivalency certificate where the DOT regs are very straightforward. Okay? And again, this is not Transport Canada's fault. The reg was the reg we created the batteries. So what we'd like to see for Transport Canada is to put all EV batteries, hybrids as well, into one, just call it an EV class, and then let's get alignment with the DOT, which allows batteries to flow across borders. If we don't, here's what happens. A battery that wants to come up to Canada from the US is allowed to leave the US on a pallet, but it's gonna go into Canada and they can't. So you have to move a container from Canada to the US to put it in the battery, the battery in it to ship it across the border. And you start to get into these things, and then what you go is like, why would I do that? And then all of a sudden, Lithion, Lifecycle, Serva, and Trail will have trouble getting batteries out of the US, even though Washington State should be going up the trail, and, and uh, New York State should be going up to uh, Lithion and Lifecycle, right? Th those are things we gotta think about, and that's the type of policy change that we need to see. Um, so storage side of things, the, we're going to get into a place where we're going to want to aggregate moving in Canada far west to east, far east to, to west. <clears throat> to aggregate, you're going to need a storage facility. And you, we just got to get some clarity around storage. Every province has different rules for holding these batteries. This comes back to a national policy. There needs to be a 12-month window where you're allowed to hold an end-of-life battery so you could build up. Uh, truckload and get some better freight rates if, if that's what you want to move. So that's what that recommendation is to, um, to our governments. Um, number five is about support initiatives under development. So sharing, labeling. We talked about labeling today. <coughs> labeling is going to get clearer, but it's not quite clear today, particularly for, for us who have batteries in our yard from vehicles 10 years ago. I think we'll get to a place where you're going to have two types of labels. One is going to be the chemistry, the manufacturer, the manufacturing date kind of label. There's an ISO, sorry, there, I apologize. There's an SAE standard for that, SAE J2984. You could go buy that one. Sorry, you have, everything from SAE you have to buy. SAE J2984, it's a label. The second label that I think you're gonna see is um, a little bit more what we might need uh, around um, serial number. Uh, there'll be a QR code that's supposed to take you to a data sheet. There'll be a manufacturer name on that. There might be a part number, a product number. I think we're gonna see that type of info labeling. And then of course, there's gonna be the dangerous, good, safe label, all those ones where we see that the triangles and diamonds and things like that. We'll get to that place, but suffice to say today, it's not all the same. The OEMs know it, and it's working towards. Safe removal instructions, um, there's a lot of good stuff for the first responders, absolutely. Uh, for the dismantlers, it, that is available. I think what you're gonna see Organizations like ICAR, who, who are doing some really good training programs for the industry, ICAR is in the US, really good training programs. I think that's coming, I'm seeing it. I'm seeing even some tools being developed for that. Um, I just, this is where I caution everybody, just be careful, you've gotta really know what you're doing when you start to take the batteries apart. And so, so that needs to be uh, more standardized. Um, collection and management of low economic value batteries, there is some movement in the industry between the OEMs, industry supporters, government, and I think we'll start to see that to address the bottom of the triangle that was orange. Training standards, we've talked about this. This is one area, I think, um, policy, um, even the Canadian Standards Association, I, I think we need to take some leadership here and create a safety standard that puts Canada at a really good threshold. We do not want to lose any of our employees when they're working with these batteries. And 
it's the weakest link. We all get that statement. The weakest link is going to take down the industry. I'd love to see a standard for safety. I'm just going to pull it all together here. Um, EV batteries are part of the circular economy. We need these batteries to be recycled so that we could get them into new batteries to propel our vehicles. We are way more formed um, than we thought when we started this project. We see it. Um, and we're sharing this so that everybody can have visibility to how well structured the industry is coming. The EV batteries are not going to landfills. That was a myth that we, we had heard a few times. Uh, they're too big, they're too heavy. It's illegal to take them to landfill. I'll tell you one quick story to show how this works. Is um, we got a call from a electronics sorter and just met like an electronics company that sorts and takes apart electronics. They ended up with a module from a vehicle in one of their waste bins, and their waste bin was at a municipal waste depot. And that shows how the system works. Someone tried to dispose and get it into the landfill, but electronics, we know we reroute to sorters. The sorter knew what to do, called us, we went and picked up the battery, the battery went to the recycler. Okay, so the system works. There's more than enough recycling capacity in North America. We see that on the map of North America that we showed. Uh, most batteries are managed today in different types of systems. The one that has to sort out is the one where we see in our yards, we have 10 batteries and they go back to the 2003, five, eight model years, and that's coming. Um, support industry and their effort, we've talked about that. Existing regulations need to evolve to allow EV batteries to move more freely and at, uh, at good cost structure and at low carbon footprint. And that's the piece where NRCAN takes a very big leadership at the federal level um, in conjunction with Transport Canada and Environment and Climate Change Canada. Um, and then we need the training standards and the safety standards. And if you pull all this together, just watch over the next three to five years, uh, a number of these issues that we've just talked about are going to start to sort. Thank you.